Welcome to the Equipping Leaders podcast, Leader Study Series. I'm Natasha, a leader development professional and overall leadership enthusiast. And I'm Corey, a program manager and an emerging people leader, thus a leadership enthusiast. We are doing a leader study of the TV show Z Nation, deconstructing the leaders, leadership decisions, and team dynamics of the characters on the show to look at how leadership is all around us. And even if we're not in a position of leadership, we can still demonstrate it in our actions, responses, and in the opportunities around us. Z Nation aired from 2014 to 2018, but if you haven't seen it yet, there will be spoilers in these episodes. In this episode, we're talking about Z Nation, season one, episode four, Full Metal Zombie, and episode five, Home Sweet Zombie. Let's jump in. Okay, so now we are in episode four of season one, Full Metal Zombie, and the team is definitely coming together more. We're still kind of in storming with some things, but now we're also starting to see how the team members care for each other and look out for each other and the things that they need as individuals to be great team members. So what stood out for you? Um, I think... Right, you know, right as the episode starts, they run into that situation, right, where they see a vehicle and potentially zombies, and uh, there's sort of that that pause, and Garnett is, uh, hey, you know, laying out that groundwork, they're coming up with a, sort of a plan, and then what I think is so interesting is, well, it ends up not being zombies, right, um, it ends up being rough, ruffians, ne'er-do-wells, right, that are uh trying to take all their stuff and you kind of have this um standoff of you know everyone's sort of uh going up against each other and what i think is really interesting is everyone's sort of looking to uh garnett in that situation and and warren kind of you can tell that um or at least i thought she had she wanted to take a different approach right he's like all right we'll put down our stuff we'll let them take our stuff we'll move on I seemed more like she wanted to brawl it out. Um, and I thought, you know, that showed a lot, like we talked about, you know, before with sort of that effective follower or understanding when you're leading and when you're, you're sort of listening. Um, she, she stood down a little bit and I thought that was like a, a really great leadership quality of it wasn't her time to make that call. And she respected that even though she had sort of a differing opinion. I agree. I also made note of that event because it wasn't just Warren. Warren didn't really say that she dissented with what was happening, but other people in the group did. They were like, we shouldn't yeah. give up the truck. We shouldn't do these things. But then when Garnett made the decision, they didn't question it, right? They were just like, now that's the decision and they continued to move forward. And I think that's such a powerful thing with a team because you're not always going to agree. But as the leader, you're responsible for the decision and you should take in all these other inputs. But he also was like, is this battle worth it, right? Is this fight going to be worth it? And, you know, his internal assessment was that it wasn't. So that's the other thing with leadership, with building trust is that people need to trust that you do have the best interests of the group in mind and that your actions will belie that, even if they're not what, exactly what you wanted them to do. Yeah, I think for me professionally, what's interesting about that is, um, you know, there's a lot of times where I have a differing opinion from some of the leadership that I work with mm -hmm. on, you know, things that they want to do. And, um, you know, it, it, it's funny because you, they make a call and you, and you, you go with that call, right. Even if you disagree, but, um, you know, when it doesn't, you know, if that leader makes that call and it doesn't work out, I think if, if that leader acknowledges it right like so they made that call they got rid of it we know that as the episode progresses they sort of um, um get their last laugh as it were um but uh you know i've dealt with a lot of situations where leadership has made a call it's been different from what i would have done their call ended up not being the best choice they never really talked about that right and so when we talk about that trust or belief um moving forward it's almost completely gone because they didn't acknowledge that mistake. And I think that that's, I think that's important too, right? Not necessarily applicable to the situation that we saw the team in here, but uh, something that I always think is really interesting. I don't know how often you run into that yourself, but. 
Uh, yeah, probably equal amounts. Uh, but I also think that I work with just dip, such a different industry where there are some industries, I won't even just say yours and mine, right? But it's like there are some industries where you are so conditioned that the leader is right and the leader doesn't need to ask questions and you never question the leader. But I think in other organizations and other industries, and also just with different types of leaders, they're like, I know I don't know all, all the stuff. And if I do make a mistake, it actually behooves me to admit that and let people know that I am human and I am fallible. And that in the future, what I will do to remedy that is listen better or listen more. But I think sometimes leaders set themselves up for failure in that they're like, they never revisit these different things. And you don't have to like atone for every decision you've ever made. But at the same time, when you try to make yourself seem like you don't make mistakes and that you are not fallible or that you're infallible, that it's you're setting yourself up for failure. Because then when you as a very human person makes a mistake, it seems that much bigger when really it's not. We all do that. But you put yourself on this pedestal, expect everybody else to view you on that pedestal, that it creates that challenge. Yeah, that's that's a really good point too. Because like we said, later on then when uh, they run into that family that seems to have been also you know, fallen victim to the ruffians and then turns out that that family is kind of the, you know, the one in the control. They, they, you know, they sort of get back their their vehicles and then some. And I think that that's, you know, again, like the, the play out there was he made the right call. And I, and I think that's one of those things where you talk about those little incidents that help build trust in a leader. And I think that that was you know, probably something that was key. Yeah, agreed. So then they are trying to figure out a way to get to California quicker. And Citizen Z lets them know that there is this compound and there's potentially a helicopter there. So they could potentially fly however much further. Uh, so this part, it, it made me laugh a lot because of how terrible the leader of the general was. <laughs> it was so random. Uh, and also we have a lot of information at this point that made a lot more of what he was saying just ridiculous. But I think it was one of those things where not just in the military, this could be a leader anywhere where they are in their head and they have created this persona of a leader. And that's what they always need to portray, regardless of what reality around them is saying. So I know the general was just kind of shouting random things about get this air support, get this here, get this there. When obviously at this point, we already know that the government has kind of fallen and even Citizen Z, the most connected person, can't connect with anyone. So then you have this person who is just kind of making all these threats and all of that. So I think it also shows that in these high pressure situations, even people who seem to have really great training or seem to have really uh, a lot of skills around quote unquote leadership, that they can still devolve very quickly into not only toxic behaviors, but also there's like obviously very serious signs of mental illness there, uh, which is the zombie apocalypse. There's going to be some of that. <laughs> I Even as they were like approaching that building that the general was in, what I thought was interesting was you had that like lone uh, guard, you know, down at the bottom, that military guy. And, you know, the general's very busy and you can't go see him and this, that, and the other. And, and, you know, when it turned out that like, you know, do, um, you know, Doc's sort of stock and trade, if you will, is what the guy was interested in. And I just he had um, self-interested goals that he was masking behind this veiled, broad um, objective from the general. Right. His like senior mm -hmm. leadership. And I I laughed at that part because I was like. Maybe not always for, you know, what Doc tends to, to to peddle in, but it's like the amount of times that I've run into people where they will take the grander plan and sort of manipulate it to fit what, you know, their own personal goals and, and then feel completely justified in it because it's under this veil of this is the, you know, this is what leadership wants. It's like, man, that was just uh, that that hit home. It's like, man, I'm ready for the zombie apocalypse already. <laughs> I think also, yeah, there's, 
And that, I mean, it's a theme throughout the show, probably because it's just a theme throughout life. And that's the do the ends justify the means. And so, and also I'm super interested in like how people justify things because you could justify anything. Like you said, like this person did in, you know, their behavior of restricting access, being a gatekeeper to what these people needed until he got what he wanted. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's super interesting. And yeah, I've definitely seen it across all types of industries. Yeah, so, and then, uh, you know, I, I think that's, uh, the general's not interested, he's not interested. And then when they find out that Doc is a is a doctor, right? Then all of a sudden he can come up and and meet that general. But yeah, I um, there's a lot of things about that general that uh, stuck out to me. So like even, um, acknowledging that it's a, a television show, right? And that there's, a, a, and I think having prior military experience, the um, but, you know, the way he had all of his medals and stuff pinned on to that combat uniform, which I, you know, I, I don't know what the truth is, a lot of those rules about as far as imitating a general on television, you know, you got to make it so it's not too real, but it was like, talk about the, the narcissism or like this, this built up belief of, all, there's, I'm calling in these airstrikes from this, you know, dead uh, satellite phone that's connected to nothing and, and everything else. It was just like, oh boy, this guy is, uh, he's off the deep end a little bit. So I thought that was interesting. It was, it was very performative. And even the whole, like where he was like yelling at the president and insulting the president. When we know even Murphy, when he was injected in episode one, he was like, isn't that person dead and they were like not when she signed this order and so it's like we already know that again we already know that all the things that this person is saying and doing are uh performative right and are just trying to create the illusion but the other thing too that's really interesting is kind of like we were talking earlier where we try some leaders try to make themselves seem infallible he was probably thinking i need to keep up this appearance for the other people on this compound like maybe he was doing it like to make sure people still believe his approach wildly inappropriate, of course, but just like sometimes that mindset though, of like, Oh, well now as the leader, I just have to keep this whole thing going. And I think that, or as the, the person in charge, I should say, because I think that in reality, there's this adaptability, of course, that leaders need to be like, yeah, what is the reality? And even when, Garnett and Warren and all them, even when they can't get in touch with Citizen Z, it's like they still have this end objective. And so they're not making stuff up and they're willing to adapt and kind of shift to get to that. But like the how doesn't always have to be the same. Yeah, I I forget what the, what the I see, because the other thing I, I think I saw from that, that general, like if we put him in the, the bad leader, but in that leadership role is I guess that wouldn't be confirmation bias isn't the word I want, but like um, he's so blinded by whatever that last task was, right? Defend that building or or do whatever that even though it is apparent to everyone that that no longer is viable, he's just sticking to it. Mm -hmm. And like I was told that this is what we need to do or I was told this is going to work. So this is what we're going to do. And I think that's a trap that I've seen. Um, you know, a, a lot of leaders, especially within that program management realm, um, a lot of newer program managers, they get a, a contract or they get like a tasking sort of order uh, from, you know, what, whomever that customer is. It's very apparent that it doesn't work, but, but they, they refuse to go back because they look at that as failure as them as a manager or as a leader. Um, and they refuse to um, adapt from that plan, even though it's clear that it's not working. And I think that it's something when you start looking at, at differences in leadership styles, that that whole idea of like failing fast within a lot of the agile principles, um, you know, so things like Scrum or Safe, I think that's where my mind is always, if it's clear it's not working, let's make that micro adjustment so that it does work because do we care about the process to get to the end state or do we care about the end state? And so I think that that's, I think that was really interesting too a, a, of a sort of scene. Yeah. I love that because, yeah, it really makes it, yeah, what is like systems thinking and then what is task thinking, both very different ways of thinking and typically not found within the same person. Just, and that's what, you know, that's what makes teams great and effective or completely ineffective. I think another piece too with the general is sometimes someone is in leadership and they've been very effective in the past. 
that doesn't mean you need to be a leader forever. And there are times when it's like your time is finished and you need to step down or you need to step away. And so there was also that piece of if someone's no longer effective and then they become a bully or they become something that is not actually influencing or moving something forward, then how would you remove them from that position, right? Because there's going to be feelings. There's going to be a lot of feelings, but you know, what's actually best for the group. And that wasn't something they were dealing with here, but it made me think of that where it's like, you see some people who they just fight too hard when they're asked to leave a position. And it's like, I mean, not to be dark, but like any of us could be hit by a bus at any point, right? We don't, like there needs to be something else, some continuity. If things are working only when you're there, then they're not truly working. So you need to make sure things can work when you're not there. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, then when you start to look at the team members too, and you like when you talked about those sort of um, uh, like uh, the the folks like Doc or like 10K who are leaders, but kind of like more in the back leaders. And you look at that mentor, mentee relationship that Doc sort of has with 10K. I, it's in this episode too, where you start to get those um, flashbacks to 10K with his dad. Mm -hmm. um who's who seems to be sick right now you know you can make the assumption you know getting ready to be zombified um but uh i think it's interesting too when you look at how that sort of um earlier stage in his life and you could you could say career right because that was still in the zombie apocalypse right and um like how that sort of those earlier stages of like a compass of like what are good qualities or whatever how that can sort of like manifest itself moving forward from that base and so you know then when you have someone like doc who emulates or it appears emulates a lot of the same sort of characteristics or values that 10k's dad has i think that moving forward as well is is pretty interesting right and we talk about team dynamic and group dynamic and making people thrive um you know it's like would 10k do bad without doc in the group probably not would he mature and advance as a as a leader as an individual on that team uh may, maybe not as quickly or maybe not as well right so I, I think that's pretty interesting too yeah you said a lot of great things in there so one is the the we are drawn to people that remind us of people that we love and respect and so it doesn't mean that every leader has to try to like emulate our parents not everybody loves to respect their parents but it's this like like that's like the piece of leadership where it's so important to be authentic because that is going to vibe with someone and it's going to change their trajectory as a professional, as a leader, as all those different things. And I also really liked what you said about that, like the base of who we are, the foundation, like all of these moments of life. I don't want to get too philosophical, but too late. All, these, <laughs> all these things like really do shape are how we reframe things, how we frame things, the lens that we look through, um, you know, all of our developmental frames, they're all through these very like core memories and these things that were maybe not important to others or were very important to us, but they do truly shape who we are. And when we can also find someone else who kind of like 10K with Doc, who is just so masterful, like even subconsciously even masterful at helping someone walk through that. I think that's a really incredible thing. I think that's what really helps people evolve as leaders. Because there's a point near the end of the episode where, you know, throughout the episode, 10K just kind of says, you know, I don't know if my dad knew what I did, what I did, or I wish he knew or that I could tell him. And at the end, Doc just says, you know, your dad knows what you did for him. And so sometimes it's this, like, we almost need this, like, permission slip or somebody to just say it because we know it and it's in our head. And, like, we're like, yeah, he knows, right? And, like, people can say it. But then it comes from someone like that, someone who means something to you, whose input and perspective actually matters. And that can break something wide open and really help us evolve through it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting, especially... Because, you know, the, and then during that episode, when Doc uh, gets pushed down that, um, I'm just going to say mine shaft. That's not the word I'm looking for. Uh, the shoot. Air, the, the shoot. shoot yeah. The air <laughs> shoot shaft thing. Ooh, that was a struggle. Um, but, uh, yeah, when he gets pushed through that, um, 
obviously he's like he's trapped with that zombie right there he's in a little bit of danger i think what's really interesting about that too is the team um you know once they assess and realize like that he's in danger they they kind of shift their focus shift their plan to go find him right as they're um you know looking for him they run into that danger or whatever and then i think garnett ends up pushing a zombie down the chute that you know is uh, on fire is gonna you know potentially explode so they just assume that doc is lost after that happens right and um you know so they they made that concerted effort they realize that they move on right they're continuing down that that with that focus and then when he sort of shows up um in the end there i think that's really cool because i think murphy also starts to mature a little bit as a character there because he was interested in doc safety and i thought that that was like i thought that was a pretty interesting growth point for him over this like perceived trauma and then the fact that because doc like we talked about earlier was one of the first ones to short sort of um be a little bit more humanizing with murphy and um you know i i wonder what was going through murphy's mind at that point to like lose his only sort of friend or mm-hmm. like that anchor point and you just think about teams when you might have folks that are working really well together and someone moves on um, that they were close to or, you know, whatever that is, sometimes losing that one team member from like a, um, uh, like a progress or productivity perspective, really it's like losing two people because now you also have that other person kind of going through this pseudo grief phase of losing that, that coworker. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I've run into several times just because the nature of my industry, you have a lot of turnover sometimes. And, um, you know, so that was, I thought, a, a pretty interesting sort of scenario that played out right there towards the end of the episode. I like that. I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. So the piece of even them, like hearing him calling out and knowing that, like, he was still alive, it goes to this team thing of like, you if a team member is still a viable option right doc was still alive then you do what is appropriate to make sure that they're in the fold right you you go back for them they were like we're going to go looking for him but like you said when they believed that he was no longer alive then a team member is no longer a viable option so sometimes you have things in the professional world where just someone is not a good fit and maybe they're not a good fit from the start maybe they're not a good fit anymore and so they're not a viable team member so it's not like you're going to go out of your way and do all of these things to make sure that somebody who doesn't care and doesn't want to be there is still part of the team right you just there's the what is the viable team member but also i really liked what you said about the it just goes back to doc and how it's like there's a there leadership is influence. I think it was John Maxwell who said that, like leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. But at the same time, the influence that he had because he's just who he is and he shows that care, that is like just the base of great leadership. So maybe they wouldn't follow him yet, but they certainly have feelings about going back for him. And if he were no longer there, it would have very seriously impacted all of the members of the team because when he was kind of walking up at the end and they thought that he wasn't alive or that he he you know was a zombie everyone was very upset about that right there wasn't one person on that team who was like man so i also i i thought it was interesting too when the you like you're at the the general like they all walk in on his like office and he's got that conference table filled with all of those uh mercy like zombie former military leaders and i'm like god is there any more quintessential photo of like surrounding yourself with yes men right people who are never going to dissent from your viewpoint and you know when you think about he's you know kind of went a little little crazy there and it's like well there's nobody nobody again calling him out because all the people he had surrounded himself with there were never going to disagree with him right so i think that that's also like yeah maybe you should always make sure you get some differing opinions around you it's not like you always have to um act on them but you should always be able to hear them so i I thought that was pretty interesting as well yeah absolutely no i thought that was a really yeah, it was an interesting episode. It did make me laugh a lot as far as the whole like 
just poor leadership in action or poor uh, positional leadership in action. And uh, yeah. Well, then I, it was because like the other thing too, from that whole arc of there's a potential helicopter you can have, they thought almost uh, up until the point of, you know, realizing Doc was alive, they lost a very valuable team member um, to that, to their little team structure um, like that we know had some of that medical piece also had some of that like shoulder to lean on listening piece. So a quintessential piece of that team they lost for this helicopter that they end up finding out is not is essentially not real, right? It's broken down. It doesn't have an engine or rotors or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I think when you look at like Citizen Z is the one who told them to go there, they fought really hard to get there. Uh, what I also thought was interesting was he made the best call he could with the data that he had. And it wasn't like the team now with him, especially being like you had said earlier, um, uh, last time we were talking about the, him being the remote worker, they didn't attempt now to ostracize him because he, right. It was like that decision was made in good faith. And I think that that's something that's like really important too, to think about was like, you know, sometimes you, you, you also, kind of contradicting myself from earlier right sometimes you just have to operate under that trust that somebody's making a call the best call they can make with the decision that they have and that's not always the easiest thing to do so yes yeah not every yeah not all information is perfect but like you've been saying you know it's can you listen to all the things that are going on around you and yeah it's it's interesting because i hear a lot of people who say like how do you lead in ambiguity you don't. It's just called leadership, right? Because yeah. none of us know what's going to happen. And so it's you knowing how to use information, be accountable and take responsibility that makes you able to lead in ambiguity. There's no like, it's just, there's no like, these are the five steps to leading in ambiguity. So yeah, being able to take in that information and accept the information at face value and not say, oh, well, you gave me bad information. If someone does give you bad information, you can address that, but it's not a, again, these are the messengers. You're the decision maker. Don't kill the messengers or they're all of a sudden going to stop giving you any information, which is the last thing you want. No. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. But like you said, very good, uh, very good episode. Very good episode. Yeah. And from there, we go into uh, the episode Home Sweet Zombie, episode five of season one. And this is so like where I feel like the last episode, we kind of got this other insight into 10K and how he was building relationships with people in the group. And now we get to see Warren, right? And kind of some of the things that she was needing to deal with. So they're trying to outrun this tornado. They realize that along the way to outrunning this tornado, they need to go back to Warren's and a home base or her home that she had to leave where she left without saying goodbye to her husband. And so one of the kind of the opening pieces that I thought was really interesting was Garnett being so supportive of that. Warren was just kind of like, nah. but it was interesting to see that Garnett saw that this was something she needed to do. And as a great co-leader, as a great thought partner, was really encouraging her to kind of face those demons and knowing that like, even though we resist things and there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of grief, when there is trust in your co-leader or trust in your teammates, it makes you more brave to feel like you can face certain demons and kind of go through different things because you don't feel as alone. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, that's fantastic. I didn't even view it in that lens. I think the thing that stuck out to me the most from a leadership perspective was as that episode opens and they're in that kind of like secure, like that safe house, right? Um, and everyone's there. Um, you know, you have people playing cards, you have people, you know, um, you know, furthering um like their sort of bonding connections um in the episode. And you see uh, Garnett and Warren go out to clear the zombies off of that electric fence, right? So I thought that was really cool as the leaders that they acknowledge that, hey, people are taking a nap, they're catching their breath. There's like this, these small, like little um, uh, 
uh, little tasks that need to be done, right? The general, like in this case, literal housekeeping that needs to take place. Uh, they did that, right? They didn't ask anybody to help. They just acknowledged that the team was bonding, that they were resting, that this was good. And so they took it upon themselves to go out, you know, take care of some of those smaller tasks, as well as like bond and, and communicate on their own front too. And like you had said, right, kind of point out that maybe we need to go back and, and reassess your home, or Garnett said to Warren. So I thought that was like, I thought that was really interesting too, of good leadership of the teams worked really hard. We tried to get that helicopter. It didn't work out. Let's give them a break. You know, we can do this, this little stuff. So I, I thought that was, uh, that was a great kind of leadership principle and skill there. Yes. I think it was interesting too, is you also saw when Garnett was encouraging this, like, let's go back to this, you know, your home there for you to get this closure. Warren, you saw her frustrations mounting, mounting. So up to this point, she's been pretty, she might say something here and there, but for the most part, she was not a, she's not a clapback person at this point, yeah. even with Murphy or whatever. But then somebody says, you know, Citizens East says that we should go this other route. And she was against it. And you could feel these frustrations mount mounting because it was like, now here are these choices. Continue on with this mission and let her just kind of compartmentalize and put this in the back of her mind or go and face this other thing. And I think the other thing that's really interesting about how this episode played out was that Sometimes as leaders, we have to face things super publicly. And so whether it's because we're in a position that gets a lot of publicity or with our team, but that can be, that can make something that's so personal, that's difficult to walk through on your own anyway, even more scary and make us really like push against it to be like, there's no way I'm dealing with my trauma in front of my team. There's just no way. But in this situation, it was like, she was kind of being forced to essentially like she agreed to it but it was also like lack of options so it was interesting to see her frustration mount and then her even lashing out about like why should we be listening to citizen z when you're like you know because it's you're actually in danger like you should actually do this yeah no that's i i also think it's just, right it's the zombie apocalypse these people now live work survive together and and so it's using I can't say that if I was ever in a similar situation professionally without zombies, um, that I would be so forceful with like, um, like a fellow leader about something, right? Like digging something up at work too, because I think that that's a fine line of being support structure for somebody. And then also, um, you know, not letting work just be work. Cause for some folks, like work is an escape. Uh, from like a bad home life or a bad situation too. So some people don't want that cross stream, right? They want to be able to come to the office for eight hours, whatever, right? They want to be able to come in for their work day and just let go of that stuff at home and, and vice versa. You know what I mean? Sometimes when I get home from work and my wife asked me how my day was, uh, it could have been miserable. I'm just saying it's good, good day, fine. I don't want to, I don't want to bring it home. You know what I mean? Like I'll just mm -hmm. leave it there it'll be tomorrow problem type thing. So it's not even not wanting to deal with um, or like confront a situation, but sometimes it's just like you need to recharge. You need to get into a different or better frame of mind than maybe where you were, or where you left it. So I think that that's really interesting too. And I think I've had, so the two instances in my life where I had just a major death of someone that I cared about in my life. I remember being like, Cause I, I just, I can be very task oriented. So it's like, that's what helps me get through things. Somebody asking me to not come to work is going to be 10 times more stressful for me than just going to work. Not because I'm afraid I'll miss something, but kind of like you said, where it's like my mom, I can't just sit in this all the time. Mm -hmm. But I know like several years ago when my mom passed, I was like out there, you know, taking care of that situation and, you know, funeral arrangements and all that. And then I remember talking to a senior person who uh, he was my mentor, amazing human. And because we had this great trust, I believed what he said. He knew me well enough that if he said something, I would take pause and actually heavily consider it. And I said, you know, oh, I'll be back next week. Right. I've been gone about a week. And he was like, no, you won't. Like you won't come back for a couple of weeks. So just be like there with your family, like do that thing. And so I think that also just like him kind of encouraging and 
essentially being like, don't you come back here. (laughs) You could go, you know, you could do something, but you can't come here. But that was really helpful because then it did let me be in that more and actually kind of work through it. And then similar to a more recent uh, death that I had in the family where it was like, my boss was just like, don't come to work. Do not come to work for the rest of the week, right? Like just, you could call me, we'll take care of all these, th- like, don't worry about things, but you go do what you need to do to move through this. And so again, it was somebody that if if I had worked, if it hadn't been those two people, I'll be honest, I would have just been like, okay. And then I would have come to work the next day, right? But there was also this trust in, I knew that they saw me as a human, not just as a, you know a coworker that I think also kind of empowered me to take that time and do the things that I actually needed for myself. Yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. And I think it's, I think it's great to also hear like about um, like leaders or organizations that, you know, know and are aware enough of their, their people to, to look at it past the policy of like, uh, uh, well, oh, you had a death. Was it one of these four categories? In which case then you get three days, to seven days of bereavement leave. And please make sure you use this charge code, um, you know, when, when filing that and mm-hmm. it must be taken in four hour chunks or, you know, whatever the rules are. Cause I, I'm, I don't deal well with, um, with death myself. So sometimes like it's also as a leader, when you have folks that are in those situations, I really want to be supportive. Um, but it's just something I struggle with myself. Right. So there's a, I, where they're feeling um, sadness and grief, I'm feeling this almost anxiety to, to try to work with them about that. And, and it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not from lack of compassion or caring or respect about that person, their well being. It's just like my own personal hang up. So I think it's interesting too, because I know, and we know from the episode that. Um, really it's, you know, Warren, her husband, who she kind of lost contact with and everything else, who is, you know, it's, it's pretty much safe to assume might be passed away. But, um, up until this point, she has no confirmation of that either. And I, and so it's, it's in that Schrodinger's state of, you know, uh, of, of where are they? And so, you know, it's one of those things where I think Garnett, it's, I don't know, right. I struggle with it because I, it's like never give up hope. Right. And so like Garnett in trying to help her move on is also taking her hope. But I also realize that that's, it's like for her own good and the betterment of the group. Right. So I don't know. Right. It's like that needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few type thought process. I don't know. But that whole, I just think if she didn't want to go to uh, back to where she was, don't, don't force it as much but i do think when it came down to because he was a firefighter they went to like his firehouse or whatever um i thought that the way he handled that situation of like mercying those zombies letting her figure that out taking that time like there was nothing else mattered in that moment he was there with her and whatever that was going to be was what that ended up being even with a giant tornado coming in so i thought that was pretty interesting interesting because i didn't also view it as (laughs) <laughs> as him taking her hope, I viewed it as him giving her the closure that she needed. Because if you're always questioning something, then it is going to limit how far you can go, right? It's going to limit these other things for you. So I viewed it more as him helping to give her that closure of, you know, but what is it? Like, is he still there? Like, is there still truly a possibility for that to be a thing like that relationship? Or is it not? And, you know, are you just always going to wonder? So, yeah, I kind of viewed it just more as a closure piece than a removing hope piece. And there is the difference between a healthy understanding and coping mechanisms with death and an unhealthy mechanism. (laughs) But, okay, so when uh, Warren and Garnett were going to the firehouse because they were looking for the additional supplies. Yeah. One thing that several things, great things happen. You're right. Like he gave her that space to essentially like, because they couldn't find her husband, give her that space to do what she would have wanted to do for him. And I thought that that was really amazing. And he was just very present. Sometimes people just, we just need other people to be a witness to something that we're going through. And I think that Garnett did a really beautiful job of that, but also when they're in the firehouse and 
they, you know, there's zombies come, trying to come in from outside. There's also tornado out there, so pretty serious. But then there's the zombies inside. Garnett deferred to Warren's experience of the area. Where do we go? Like, what yeah. should we do? Like, do we go out? Do we stay in? And so, yeah, so that, like, trusting your teammates and what they know, I think, is something that's super important. And he did. And then he didn't question it. He wasn't like, well, but what about? She said, you know, it's safer in here. And that's then what they did. They decided to stand there and fight those zombies. So I thought that was also another really good thing where it was almost the flip side of this co-leadership relationship we've seen where she would defer to him usually, but then he just was like, like literally your lane, literally your place. So we'll defer to whatever you say is the right thing. Yeah, I. It was interesting, too, because so while they were throughout this whole episode, so while they were at the firehouse, um, you had um, Addie sort of going through some um, like trauma and you had, um, you know, Mac was kind of trying to help with that, especially since those two were so close. You had um, Murphy sort of starting to he's also going through some some like mental stuff. You had this storm in the background. I realized like a lot of that was from um uh they they were kind of at a point of rest right in the in the show as it were there there was zombies and stuff but they were relatively safe and secure and then i also from a television show perspective you have this storm of foreshadowing and you know blah blah blah, blah. but you know you did not have um warren or garnett there to sort of help with that and keep them like task focused so all of a sudden everybody started breaking off and like again like that leadership and keeping that focus and that overall goal moving forward i think that we see where that loss of of a leader within that team dynamic that now had become not not reliant because they're all still functioning right they've got the oh. guy that that was sick that they found in warren's house um and you have doc uh trying to work through that with um you know uh murphy and stuff so it, it's like but right, that leadership driver of keeping the team together, keeping them on task and on focus, um, I think also sort of helped prevent some of those um, those creep ins. You know what I mean? Those emotional creep ins, which I think if you apply that over, at least to my job, tends to be scope creep, right? Where you have people that have little side projects or other folks in these tasks, and all of a sudden, whatever that main goal is that we're working for, you start to lose that if you're not making sure that everyone's staying somewhat focused, right? So. Mm. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting as well. I like that. And I completely agree. And I also viewed it as, yeah, when people, emotions come up and people start to feel very insecure about their work and very insecure about their role if they don't have a reminder. So they will start to break off. So I appreciated just the, like, Addie's going through something, starting to have these flashbacks. Yeah. So, but that's just it. Like people in the workplace are like, Maybe your boss is out, right? For whatever reason, they're on vacation, they're sick, they're super busy, it's whatever type of week. And you're like, I haven't talked to my boss. Obviously they hate me and they think my work is crap, but like, obviously not true, but it's like, we will have these things where it's like in a previous role or even not to get like all like psychologists on, on us, but you know, even like things from childhood where it was like, yeah, I always really had, if I didn't have my parents' attention, I was out of sorts with them, right? So I need these different things to feel connected. So yeah, I think that, yeah, that's another really important piece of leadership is like, how are you connecting and how often? And are you giving people what they need in those moments? So some people really do just need to be, you know, they just need to be loved on and just know that what they're doing is great and, you know, they're doing the right things and you're here to support. Other people need directives, right? So it's just this like kind of understanding what people need. But it was interesting in this episode to see how they did work to support each other because they were still a team. They still all came together, right? So Mac trying to support Addie, not letting her be by herself for too long. And, you know, Murphy's going through his whole thing. But, you know, Doc was trying to keep him at least near him and Mac when they were working on the guy in the basement. And so even though Murphy kept saying wildly inappropriate things to that couple and it was really making the situation much worse, but they were never like, get out of here. Like you're not helping. I mean, they, I think they stated that he wasn't helping, but they weren't like now go away. So that's just it where it's like all these different personalities come together. There's this tragic thing and you don't have leadership right now. And then this is what can happen even with a really high performing team. 
Yeah, no, I. That, that's great. I, I think it's, I think when Murphy came down, he like shaved his head because I think his hair was falling out, it's starting to turn blue or whatever. And Doc's like, when you not the best time for a haircut, or he makes some sort of like quip like that. But yeah, it's um because then Max sort of re- I think also in that point realizes that Doc needs more help than Murphy's able to give him and sort of, you know, leaves Addy alone a little bit because I think he's also not given up on her, but realizes like whatever she's going through or dealing with, she's got to do this at her own pace. And he wasn't, he's no longer helping or could be more help somewhere else. And I I think that that's uh, uh, like really important as well. Yeah. And then, so uh, Warren and Garnett, they come back to the house, to Warren's home and they go to seek shelter. And when Doc and all of them are asking Garnett where Warren is, because Warren has decided to put herself in a room upstairs, uh, you know, she's working through her thing. Husband's favorite really, chair. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, but when they ask where Warren is and Garnett says she's not coming and they're like, oh, but what about this? And he's like, she's not coming. So what I loved about that moment too, was it was like to indicate that she had made her decision and no one should risk their safety to try and change her mind. That it was like, that's what that is. And she, she's not coming. So I thought that that was also really powerful for Garnett. Cause you could tell that it was like, sometimes as leaders, we have to do things. We move in a direction and maybe we hate it. Right. Or we are not sure about it, or we just wish it could be different, but that's the reality. And part of leadership is defining reality for others so that they don't waste their time. And I think that was something he did really masterfully in that moment. Yeah. I, um, yeah, because now, as I think about it, too, when she was up there, you know, kind of looking through those wedding photos and just like accepting that, you know, her husband was no more, that she was never going to see him again. You know, he was he, he was still trying to get her to come down, but then ultimately realized losing two people was not really the, the, the best option. So he gave it, you know, gave it a shot. She'd made that decision. And like you said, he just sort of accepted that finality. And I, I yeah, that was that was pretty good. Yeah. But I think also 10K and Cassandra go and hide in the car from the tornado. You're surrounded by several brick buildings. I just that it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> no real leadership things to uh, pull from that. Let's just uh, acknowledge that uh, maybe you do need a leader to make decisions sometimes. <laughs> <'cause>... <laughs> uh, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another uh another great one okay 